There will be two kinds of them. Verse 27 now. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so he made two kinds under the umbrella of mankind. He made a male kind and he made a female kind. And these both together are created in the image of God. Now that right there, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is high respect, amen, that his creations are the top of his creation in the world. There is nothing above that in the world's creation than mankind. And mankind is so high that unlike any of the other animals created by God, they got a special designation. They alone, is this good, are created in the image of their maker. Yeah, this is a very special creation by God, the way that he created women and men. In the very image of God, they are three-parted. This is one uh, way, a very simplistic explanation I'll make here that I don't get sidetracked. But I'm very excited about this. Uh, he has made us three-parted. We have um, things that happen in our judgment, in our reasoning, our, our logic lives. We make decisions. We make plans. We connive. Nothing else in his creation can do the things in the ways that mankind does. Hmm? And the woman part of mankind is no different in this respect than the man part of mankind in that respect. So these two, male and female, were created both in the image of God. Now there's only two kinds, only two. You're one or you're the other, and it'll be the woman kind of mankind that will, that will have this potential to be a life giver, to be a life giver. Now, listen to this. The original giver of life is God himself, hmm? because the first creation among mankind would be Adam, and he was created solely by God. And so God is the first to actually give life. Now, Adam wasn't made in water like the ones after him. The others after him will come from life-giving water. Man, Adam was created, in fact, by the dust, the very opposite of water. He was created by dust. By the way, Adam was not created in the Garden of Eden. He was created outside the Garden of Eden. Then God did the garden and took the man that he had made outside the garden and put him inside the garden. Eve was created in the order of that garden. That right there explains a lot. Mm -hmm. So here's the creation of mankind then, male and female. Now skip, skip over to chapter 2. And pick it up with me, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so man, kind, had a wonderful creation in the image of God, given dominion over everything. And now the two are living inside the order of the garden. There's one thing that will change it all. And that's what the warning is for in 2.17. It's a warning against sin. Don't take that which I have not given you to eat. Eat what I have given you. Now, it seems so simple. It seems like such a simple command, and yet they couldn't... Stay away from it. Verse 18, here's the fall of this awesome creation, and there's going to be a tremendous consequence of it. Verse 18 now, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. So this is God's thought. When he had made Adam from the dust... God lets us know that his thought 
was that it, it won't be good if he stays alone. Adam needs something to help. And this is God's idea of woman. There's a description here, a double description. In the very end of verse 18, he uses this word help and he uses the word meet. I want to break this down a little. This word help in the Hebrew is azer, azer. It means helper, helper. This is a special helper. In fact, the Lord used that same word of himself later in the Bible, azer, E-Z-E-R, for your notes, this word helper. The Lord used that word of, him, of himself to describe a situation that God would save man out of a desperate situation. That's how God used the word azer, helper of himself regarding man. That he would azer, that he would give a help that would save out of a desperate situation. So here again is high honor in the word of God for a woman. To think that in the very beginning of God's communication to us about the need to make one of those women... That he uses this word azer. I'm going, to, I'm going to make an azer, a help. That could possibly mean that the reason for the construction of this woman is to save a man out of a desperate situation. Is that good? Is that good? If you're married today, if you are a married woman today, do you realize that this is a part of your role possibly? That you would save your husband out of a desperate situation? So I want to give you a challenge today married women that if if that is a possibility that God would have made you and in the womanly role of wife that you could save your husband possibly out of a desperate situation does this scream for the need for consistency to help him in the daily grind of his own life oh yeah Ladies, please don't look for a mountaintop experience that, that you'll pull him out of the well one day in his life. But look for a consistency of a day-to-day -day life that you help him in many ways. Maybe that he won't end up in a disastrous situation that he needs to be pulled from the soup. Huh? But what high honor God gives this, this place of womanhood. The second word here is meet. It's not one word cobbled together. It's not helpmate. That's not the word. It's help meet. If you, if you put those two together, it destroys the respect of a woman. It's not helpmate. It's help who is meet. The word meet, M-E-E-T, means fitted. Do you see the respect of that? Do you see the honor of that? God is saying this woman that I'm going to build is going to be an azer, going to be a help, going to possibly be able to pull the man out of a disastrous situation. And this woman that I'm going to build is fitted for the job. Hmm? Fitted. Meet means able, up to the task. That's what God is going to do when God builds woman. And that's what he did then in Eve. It was such a powerful creation that Adam took one look at it and made a declaration, skip, skip, verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Is that good? That's Adam's call of what God had made there and given to him in the garden of God's delight. God at the end of this creation of woman must have been so absolutely satisfied in his creation we got a man and we got a woman a help who is fit for the job 
And in the garden they dwelt, but there's a warning on the table. Leave that tree alone. That's not for you. Well, they bit it, didn't they? And when they did, they plunged themselves and the human race under a curse that was promised from God if they overstepped the blessings of God and took for themselves a lie from the enemy of God for a blessing that God never offered to them. Skip, skip. Here comes the curse. Let's break this down for just a moment. God goes into this judgment of man. He promised it. He must deliver it. Now, God can't change his mind. He can't change his word. He's told him the consequence, and now here it comes. He goes very specific Moses does in his description of the Lord's words now as he deals the blow that describes the curse. Genesis chapter 3 now and verse 14. First the serpent and the Lord God said unto the serpent because thou hast done this thou art cursed. Leave that one now. Verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Just want to read this verse and make a note here. You see how important this is that the woman be who she is? That the woman be the one that what she was created to be? By the woman doing the job she was created to do, she will save man from a desperate situation. It will be through the offspring of woman that man ultimately has a deliverer. And you can't get any more desperate than that situation. Amen. There is such honor and respect for women when we, we don't even have to study it very deeply. We just read the Bible story of woman. Verse 16, here comes the woman's curse. Under the woman he said... I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Notice that a lot of this curse has to deal with the reproductive ability of the woman, listen to me, that was never given to the man. It will be in the very giving of life that is couched this pain and sorrow under the curse. Now, this wasn't planned before, was it? But as a function of the curse comes sorrow and pain in conception. In the middle of verse 16, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Explain this. The last end of verse 16 Thy desire has the idea that, woman, you are going to so desire to rule over your husband. But it's not going to be that way in my order of things. It's the man in this cursed situation, in this fallen existence, it is going to be the man who rules the union. And so forevermore then there will be struggle over this arrangement under the curse in the garden. There had not been an explanation like that before. Clearly Adam was created to lead in that relationship. But now this will be spelled out that the woman is going to want to lead the husband, but that's not the divine order of things. Now is this to say that the woman is less than the husband. Absolutely not. Do you see that that would contradict the very flow of the book of Genesis. The woman is created in tremendous honor and respect by God. But now under the curse, the order is that she will not lead in the relationship with a man, though she desires it. But that the man now is shouldered with that responsibility to lead her. That's the divine order of God. 
it, it means nothing towards the idea that the man is superior to the woman. How? They are in co co-equal in essence. But someone has to take that responsibility in a fallen world. You see, things are out of bounds now. Things are not as intended in the original creation now. We have people whose eyes are open to what is evil and what is good. Man can now make a pattern of choosing what is evil in the world. And now in this union of two who are both fallen and both who are cursed, in the wisdom of God, God says, I need to establish a divine order of who's actually in charge when it comes down to that. And it's going to be this guy and not the woman. That's just God's divine order. This is not disrespect. This is divine order. And this has been so uh, misaligned, so misunderstood. Uh, some have taken advantage of this, and some have, frankly, cursed the woman themselves. No, she's under enough cursing from God, amen, without any added to it. The man himself is also under a curse. This is not about ability, that he is better in his ability than she is. This is about being assigned a role from God. From the beginning after the fall, it was so in that way. Adam's curse, verse 17, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, the final word on this curse for man, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Whenever I read that verse, I think back to my early childhood as these, these ideas were being formed in my head. And I remember my daddy with a lawnmower. That's before we ever had a riding lawnmower. We only had push mowers. And we must have had a half dozen. You know why any man has a half a dozen of something? Because others don't work. And I remember my daddy just pretty much being in a fight with the lawnmower. It must have been 105 degrees that day. And I remember my daddy's face and all the sweat was broken out on my daddy's face. And he had pulled on that cord a thousand times and that mower just wouldn't go. And my daddy was talking to that mower when the preacher pulled in. And I remember thinking in, in my life, don't, don't ever get that way, Freddie. Don't ever get mad at things. Because the poor old moor can't help it. Don't ever get yourself so flustered, so red-faced, and so sweat breaking out on your face that you would em be embarrassed if the preacher pulled in. I remember thinking these thoughts. But this is the kind of existence now that man is going to be dealing with. And you see, people are always trying to make this a battle between a man and a woman. And they're somehow bad. No, look, they're, they're both busted under sin. And they're both living under a cursed situation now. And he's going to be sweating. And he's going to have his sorrow. And she's going to have her sorrow. And they're going to have sorrow together. Be a whole lot better if they worked together in this, wouldn't it? Than that they worked apart. But we're going to have trouble. There will be trouble. And so they both now are involved with the curse. Now while we're here, Genesis 3. Look with me, verse 20. Here's the first use of the word mother in the Bible, first use in the Bible, here it is. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. What a beautiful name, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. First use of the word mother. Now, we who study the Bible have a rule that the first use is important and begs to be studied. So for the first use of this word mother, we have the word Eve here. She's called Eve. 
And then the word mother, fourth verse from the end of verse 20. I want to give you this Hebrew word. is am, A-M, am. Sometimes spelled M, which also is a beautiful name for a girl in my view. God must have thought so too. He's the one who gave the name. Am or M. And it means this, strong water giver. That's the word mother, strong water giver. Who did the name? God. She is a strong water giver woman. This in the very name of mother, strong water giver. You could write a book about that, strong water giver. And yet people so rush to the conclusion that woman is inferior to man because of what has happened now in the garden in the fall. She still holds this respect from God that she is the strong water giver. And that didn't hold true. That respect didn't hold as man marched out of the garden and into what we look back on as world history. And woman, female, mother walked into an ancient world where women were unheralded, pretty much unheralded in history. Now, every now and then a woman comes out and and she becomes a leader of, of some type. In the absence of a man, she may be a Deborah ruling as a judge in Israel. But uh, the force of, of human history in ancient times is that woman was pretty unheralded. She was not written of. They did not testify in a court. What I'm telling you is that in contrast to what God has established in the honor, the respect of this position as woman, female, and mother, that actually man's history doesn't honor the woman in that way. That in ancient history, unheralded, unable to testify in court, not considered wise enough, smart enough, strong enough to really have a an impact, an influence in the affairs of a man-dominated world. But what you find if you stick to Scripture is that God never changed his mind, that God respects, that God honors this thing that he made, that he built, that he had an idea for. Hmm? Help who is fitted to succeed. Someone who is able to save out of a desperate situation. The strong water giver. God never changed his mind about that. So when you turn the pages of Scripture, the book from God, what you find is that a surprising number of women occupy the pages of God's Word. Is that good? Is that good? Are we being honest? In a different way than the history of woman in the ancient world, you see God pulling these faces and names out of history and showing us in the Bible what woman has done in her place as strong water giver. Let's name a few. Well, we've spoken of Eve. Where would we be without her? And I say that with a pun fully intended. Where would we be without her? Well, we'd probably still be eating grapes in the garden if she hadn't flubbed in the garden. And yet, if she doesn't hold down her responsibility as strong water giver, we don't even exist. So because of her sin... Okay, we still exist. We're under a curse, but we exist. But take away the giver out of water who is strong in what she does. We don't exist. How about Jochebed and Miriam? Jochebed is the mother of Moses. You remember this? The Hebrew women were put under a death purge. Kill that baby. Kill that baby. And Jochebed disobeyed the authority. 
The Hebrew midwives were going along with these ploys that we've got to save the babies. And that baby boy had a shot to live when Jochebed, by faith, put that baby in a basket and floated it in the river. And his sister Miriam later is going to lead worship as they, as they leave that awful land of slavery and go out towards the promised land. It will be Miriam who leads the worship of God, led, led by little brother Moses. Is that good? Is that good? Where would Moses be without Miriam, who went down and watched that little basket float in the river, who made sure that she would be the communicator, that she would be the interceder, that she would make a way that that little baby boy in that basket, in this venture of faith, that because of woman, he would be plucked from a disastrous situation without her involvement. Is that good? that good? Jochebed, Miriam. How about Rahab? Here's a foreign woman who receives the two spies and by her faith in God leads those who pursue them, who pursue them astray. That this woman Rahab is thought of as a hero among Hebrews because she pulled them out of a disastrous situation. Is that good? And she was promised her temporary salvation and all her family members who could get in the house from which that red rope hung from the window. That would remind those conquerors that woman with the red thread has saved us through a red thread. Through through a chance that was as slim as a thread, she saved the lives of our spies. So spare that woman. Do you know that that woman would go on to be in the bloodline of Jesus Christ the Messiah? Had she not done her job as a strong water giver, the bloodline of Jesus is cut in its cord. Hmm? Rahab. People want to always focus on the negative, don't they? I say people want to always focus on the negative, don't they? Don't remind me of what she was. Remind me of what she became. Rahab. How about Ruth? Ruth, woman who lost her husband, but by faith followed her mother-in-law, told the mother-in-law, look, I know enough, your God, my God. And where you go, I'm going to follow you. This is all faith in Ruth. And Ruth, who doesn't have a man, follows her mother-in-law's, I should say, mother's-in-law advice, which is a real problem in the English language that they make us do it that way. But I digress. She followed the advice of Naomi and made herself available to her Redeemer. Hmm? And because of her faith, Ruth becomes the great-grandmother of King David. What about no Ruth in the story? We don't get King David. And what would God do with all those prophecies that were fulfilled by him without his great-grandmother, Ruth? Who also then is in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Do you hear me today in this respect and honor given the woman in God's word as she held her place despite all odds and despite some awful circumstances these women who came out of the woodwork to stand in their faith when it seemed like all odds are headed toward failure and there they go and become strong water givers of life that changed everything in man's history. Here's another one, Esther. She had everything against her too. No man, no man, captured, living now under a foreign entity. A foreign entity that because of the plan of a very wicked man who's going to be impaled later under divine justice, the Jews are going to be annihilated. They're going to be wiped out. And Esther alone goes and stands to pull not just a man, but to pull 
to pull the Hebrews out of the soup that literally their hope to live, to not be annihilated by a powerful king, would hang like a thread from this girl Esther, unmarried and a foreign stranger who wields such influence with her king that he would obey her voice and spare the Hebrews. Is that good? Is that good? Esther. And if Esther doesn't bear up under the odds, where would Israel be today? Hmm? These women come out of nowhere in the Bible to hold their ground of faith. Elizabeth, who will bear her son, who will be John the baptizer, who happens to be the cousin of of another girl who will be a strong water bearer, though she has no husband. These women hold up, and Elizabeth was a great encouragement to Mary. While Mary bears Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the world. That if she had given in, thrown her hands up, where would we be without a strong water bearer who will stand and literally save somebody from a disastrous situation? Would you join me in Luke chapter 8? Luke and chapter 8. Rather than name a single woman here, I just want to show you the word Luke in chapter 8. Pick it up in verse number 1. And it came to pass afterward that he, that's Jesus, went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain, here they are, certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa. Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. They ministered unto him of their substance means that they were financial contributors to the ministry of Jesus as he went from village to village bearing glad tidings. Of being the Redeemer. Is that good? that good? But look at who they are. They came out of awful circumstance. Mary, who was called Magdalene, she had no last name. She, because there were many Marys, she goes by the place that she was from, Magdala. But she had seven devils cast out of her. I mean, here's a woman who has every excuse to throw in the towel. I mean, what kind of life would lead you to that spot to be known as that Mary, that woman? Have you heard about her? Man, she had seven demons. That she would be, as they say, a pariah in the world of men. Where's any respect for a woman like that? I'll tell you who respected her. God, Jesus Christ. Who's a, is Herod Stewart? You remember this. She's married to the man who keeps Herod's house. Herod, the man who tried desperately to kill Jesus before he could ever see the light of day. <laughs> or ever be known in history, or ever go to a cross, or ever make promises of the coming kingdom of God. She works, uh, her husband works in that household. But there she is, supporting Jesus along his way as he bears glad tidings in the world. Susanna and many others, it says here, many others of these women who ministered unto him. God bless the woman who supports the ministry that bears the gospel to other people. Amen. I'm trying to make this point here to you that in the Bible, woman is a place of honor. It's such a place of respect from God himself from the top down. But it wasn't always held in human history. No, no, she was looked down on, despised. Not so in the Bible. The widow 
Remember her story, Luke chapter 21, if you want to go there. Here's Jesus standing by at the temple, and they're giving their gifts. They're paying their alms. And here comes a woman who puts in two of the tiniest coins that they knew. She gives the widow's might, the widow's might. Now, there were plenty of people who gave more than that, but she gave the very smallest gift available, the widow's might. But, buddy, she had Jesus' full attention. And Jesus knew full well it might be the smallest gift, but of the percentage, it's the greatest given because she gave her all. I can tell you as someone who is supported from the grace and favor and kindness of others in my own ministry that it's not always, hardly ever is it, the value of a gift But it's how much kindness is poured through the gift. And a very small gift can mean the house of encouragement. And buddy, it shook Jesus that day to watch her and what she gave. How many women through the course of history have done a little bit of what they could do and changed the world. Let that ripple ripple for a while. And we're still talking about that woman whose name we don't know because of the little bitty thing she gave on that day. And the ripples go on and on and on and on. She's a strong water giver woman. And then Lydia. Remember Lydia, Acts chapter 16. Paul the apostle on his journey now, he crosses the body of water, takes the gospel to another continent and meets Lydia who is a wealthy seller of cloth. That woman is for God, they're praying to God, but Paul introduces her to the Savior. Lydia becomes a devoted believer and and has the host home of the church of Philippi where Paul would make his headquarters in that area of the world. Lydia, seller of purple, what a great woman and so respected by God and is known throughout the world today. I saved one. In the very end, but would you meet me in 1 Timothy chapter 2? 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let me explain here what you might consider a very controversial passage. I don't think it should be. I think the Bible is very clear in its meaning here of what this is. This is Paul the Apostle dealing with Timothy in um, the matter of order in the local churches. And he says in verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. What we're talking about here is in the order of churches. This is not that that, uh, Paul puts a gag on, on women and says, you stay home, don't do anything, don't say. No, this is the order of church. Women are not to teach and to usurp authority over men in the church. This goes back to the divine order that God set way back under the curse after the fall. And that is that in, in the local church, it'll be, it'll be a kind of man. Now get this, this is not any man. This is not even man over woman. This is that God has in charge a very special circumstance that will have some men, some men who will be teachers and in authority of the local church, but not a woman at all. This is not that some man can pop up and say, I'm a man, therefore I'm in charge. No, not so at all. You have to get this in its context in the book of Timothy. But the authority person in the local church is not to be a woman. This is not that she couldn't. It's that this is not God's divine order all the way back from the book of Genesis. Does she have a place? Oh, yeah. she ha- she's a strong water giver. What kind of fool would not give her a place? A place of respect, a place of honor. Verse 13, 4. Paul explains himself, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 
notwithstanding, verse 15, now this is a very important word, notwithstanding. What he says in verse 13 and 14 is kind of tough if you're a woman. That's tough. Adam was formed first, and Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was. That's just tough to swallow. But ladies and gentlemen, that's just true history of what happened. But look at that word in verse 15, notwithstanding. That lies in contrast to any dishonor that might be attached to woman. To any disrespect that might be final under verse 13 and 14. Yeah, she fell, okay. And she was cursed, and she's lived under it ever since. But these women of Scripture... Buddy, they held their ground and walked by faith and have their place among those strong water givers. It says, notwithstanding, she should be saved in childbearing if they, he changed the tense here. Do you see this? She and then they. So Paul is not talking about a particular woman. The salvation that's here is not about eternal salvation from sin into eternal life. This saving here is that her life will be, her usability, her function, her purpose, her reputation will be saved. She will not be known by verse 13 and 14. She will be known as strong water giver. Is that good? Is that good? She's going to be known for her childbearing. Now, this is to speak of womanhood. This is to speak of womanhood. We know that all women are not to marry. There is a woman who is to stay single. And she will have her business with the Lord. Some of those women who followed Jesus, who supported him, were single women but womankind is going to be could I say redeemed redeemed purpose will be redeemed in the childbearing aspect of what woman does if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety now would you quickly turn to first Timothy uh, second Timothy chapter one let me give you an example of this second Timothy one in verse number 5, Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He speaks those words to Timothy. Paul called Timothy my own son in the faith. So let's put this together very briefly. There was a woman named Lois who had a daughter named Eunice. In time, Lois, who was a very strong Jewish mother of Eunice, saw her daughter Eunice marry outside of Israel. She married a Greek. She married a Gentile boy. We don't even know his name. He's only spoken in Scripture that he was the reason that their son Timothy wasn't circumcised as a half-Jewish son. So I'll limit my words to the father of Timothy. We just don't know much. He was not a Hebrew, and he did not allow his wife's son to be circumcised. So apparently Timothy had no Jewish upbringing that he got from his father. And even some of the customs weren't allowed to him. But watch this. God bless Lois. Do you think that Lois and her husband maybe advised their daughter Eunice, please marry among our people. Please follow the commands and don't marry outside 
of our Hebrew people. But the disappointment that they might have had that daughter Eunice married outside of the Hebrews did not cause a break between Eunice and her daughter. Is that good? Because here's Eunice who is strong. Here's Eunice who's a giver of life, not a breaker of life, who didn't break the relationship with her daughter, though she may have been disappointed in her marriage choice. So that Eunice later comes to be known as a very faithful woman, as a Christian woman. Is that good? good? Not only will she hold to her Jewish faith, but she will be a Jew who embraces the Savior, Jesus Christ, and is known as a faithful woman of Christ. Is that good? And she and her mother are together that the grandmother Lois has input into little Timothy who will be born of that union. This is a strong woman, strong in faith, strong in love, strong in kindness, strong to be a life giver, strong to hold everything together when she could be a powder. She could stick that lip out. She could cut Eunice off. She could make those family reunions miserable places to be. She could start the gossip mill. She could be the mother-in-law no one wants to be around. She could cause that family to be divided, but no, Lois holds the ground for that family and has the joy to see her daughter Eunice raising her son in the truth of Scripture. That Paul the Apostle later would say, boy, Timothy, I know your grandmother and I know your mom, and they had unfeigned faith in Christ, and I'm convinced you're just like them. And I'm glad to be known as your father in a spiritual way. Lois and Eunice. And they will end our parade, our journey through the Bible as we look at these women of history who stood their ground and reflect right back to us the glory of God who respected them so. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that women in the world today are being pressed and pushed and cajoled into a different mold than this place of high honor and respect assigned by God their maker. Be very careful. And walk in the truth as a woman, as a mother, with the God who made you. And though we are all fallen now, we still carry the dignity as we become more like the one who created us in the beginning. Let that be you. Let my wallet be your sin. This is what the fall means to us. That each one of us personally has embraced sin. Disobedience from God and his word. Let that be God. He has no sin. We do. And our sin is a barrier between us and God. We we can't get to God. He loves us. But he hates that which separates us from him. And so he did something about it. Jesus Christ came through the bloodline of Rahab and Ruth. Jesus Christ came into the world fully God, fully man. And the Bible says that he took our sin, bore it in his own body, paid the death penalty for you. He did that for you, friend. And three days later... After a bloody death, paying for your sin, he rose from the dead. There's your victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, alive today. The barrier's been removed by him. Payment's all been paid by him. He would gladly give you eternal life today. A home in heaven whenever you die, but his very presence would be with you in the family of God if you believe in today.